Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher. This is Presidential Chronicles, the series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Calvin Coolidge and the focus is the Boston police strike. The year is 1919 and Coolidge is in his first year as governor of Massachusetts and like many of his fellow governors, he's got a problem ahead in labor management relations in the post-World War environment. During the war, things had been good for American workers. Unemployment was practically zero, wages were up, the government was paying good prices to finance the war, but now after the war is over, rebalancing of supply and demand for goods and services and labor and workers were kind of concerned that they were going to get the short end of the stick. On top of all this, hanging over it all was the recent revolution in Russia, where the workers had overthrown the existing government, the rise of the Bolsheviks, and there was a concern in parts of the United States that something like that could happen over here. And there was a proof point in early 1919, in February, on the other coast, in Seattle, Washington, where a shipyard strike started, and almost immediately, more than 100 local unions in other industries as well all decided to go on strike basically shut down the entire city. And around town, you had these pamphlets and leaflets that basically said, Russia did it. You are doomed to wage slavery till you die unless you wake up. Realize that you and the boss have nothing in common, that the employing class must be overthrown, and that you, the workers, must take over the control of your jobs and through them, the control over your lives. Mayor of Seattle at the time was Ole Hansen. He drew this link as, as well to Russia. He said that the sympathy strike in his city was called in the exact manner as was the revolution in Petrograd. Well, Hansen was defiant. He was not giving in to these uh, worker demands, even as his city is effectively shut down. And pretty quickly, the press, the public, turned on the workers. They didn't like this idea of shutting down an entire city. That message got through, and the overall general strike in Seattle ended in about a week's time. Hansen was a bit of a hero, but there was also a lot of people in cities across the country who were pretty nervous that this could happen in their community. During this period, the American Federation of Labor, one of the largest labor unions in the United States, had a surge in post-war signups, including in the public sector, and for the first time, police departments. 37 of them had recently joined the AFL, including some big cities, Los Angeles, Miami, Washington, D.C. What about Boston, the largest city in Massachusetts? They had a police force of about 1,500 officers, many of whom were disgruntled and for many legitimate reasons. They had concerns about wages, really long hours, and terrible working conditions in dilapidated uh, uh, station houses around the city. Now, management was sympathetic to some of this. In fact, they gave the police officers that year a $200 raise, which was double what the other public sector workers got in Boston. But the officers counted that, look, this wasn't even keeping up with post-war inflation, and it certainly didn't solve all of their problems. Now, the department manual for the police department in Boston was very clear. They were prohibited from unionizing. So there had been an informal association called the Boston Police Association. They've been working for the last several years to work with management on some of these issues. But frankly, the officers wanted more. They wanted a union. And on August 9th of 1919, they submitted a formal application to join the American Federation of Labor. And two days later, that was approved. And now the battle was about to get on. The commissioner of police in Boston is actually appointed by the governor of Massachusetts. This goes back to a law from 1906, gets appointed by the governor for a five-year term, but he kind of has a dual reporting relationship because for issues on wages and working conditions, that the commissioner would work with the mayor of Boston. So you've got the governor involved, the mayor with the commissioner of police in the middle who are responsible for all these things. The commissioner at the time is Edwin Curtis. He had been appointed by Coolidge's predecessor, Sam McCall. He was adamant, no unionizing for his police force. He said that I desire to say to the members of the force, I am firmly of the opinion that a police officer cannot consistently belong to a union and perform his sworn duty. The scenario was mentioned that perhaps there would be a strike. Maybe it turned violent on the picket line and the police would be sent in. Would that police officer, if he's a member of a union, side with his union brothers or do his duty as the police officers were being instructed to do? This was a conflict of interest that Curtis was trying to prevent. And besides, he was clear. They signed up for a job. The manual said 
no unions. The mayor of Boston was Andrew Peters. Now he's concerned because he's thinking that if they don't get their union, maybe they'll go out on strike or maybe there'll be an entire strike, a general strike like happened in Seattle. He's trying to get in front of this. So he goes and visits with Governor Coolidge and asked him to intervene. And Coolidge was clear not going to happen. According to the governor, I feel it is not my duty to communicate with the commissioner on the subject. He had somebody in responsible for the police, and that was the commissioner, not him. And Mayor Peters had to respect that chain of command. Well, Curtis then took the next step. He actually suspended the 19 union leaders in the police force, and he issued an ultimatum. You withdraw from the American Federation of Labor, or these 19 folks are all going to be fired on September the 4th. Well, now Mayor Peters is getting pretty nervous, and so he stood up a committee, a public committee of 34 people from the community, led by a man named James Storo. And Storo's committee talked to all of the principals involved, came back on September the 3rd, the day before the ultimatum was going to go into effect and had a report and recommendations. Really three main things. The union should withdraw from the American Federation of Labor. There should be no punishment for the 19 uh, union leaders and everything else should go to arbitration. Well, Mayor Peters thought this was perfect, going to solve all the problems, but Commissioner Curtis, a firm no. All Curtis would do is he would extend his moratorium to September the 8th, but he said at that point, if they're still in the union, these 19 union leaders are going to be terminated. Calvin Coolidge that weekend, the governor actually left town the weekend of September 6th and 7th, ironically, to give a speech to the American Federation of Labor. It was in a different community on a different topic, which is irony of timing. He comes back the Sunday night on September the 7th to about to begin one of the most important weeks of his entire life. On Monday the 8th, uh, uh, Commissioner Curtis did exactly what he said he was going to do. He terminated those 19 leaders. Uh, Mayor Peters again went to the governor asking Calvin Coolidge to step in, maybe join uh, in a plea for arbitration. And again, Coolidge was consistent. He told the mayor, it seems plain that the duty of issuing orders and enforcing their observance lies with the commissioner of police. And with that, no one has any authority to interfere. We must all support the commissioner in the execution of the laws. That's Monday the 8th. On Tuesday the 9th, the union took a vote, 1,132 to two to go on strike. And at 545 that afternoon, about three quarters of the force, a little over 1,100 officers walked off the job. Now, Mayor Peters, again, he is very concerned about safety in his city, and he wanted the governor uh, to call out the state guard to come in and protect uh, the people of Boston. Now, uh, Governor Coolidge talked to Commissioner Curtis about this, and Curtis said, no, this is not needed. He still has a quarter of his force. There were other security officials he could call upon. And in fact, he was actually looking for volunteers from the public to sort of stand guard and help as they kind of work through this process. So Coolidge supported the commissioner. They would not call out the state guard. He went to bed, and this was the one decision that week that uh, Governor Coolidge would actually come to regret because it was a pretty rough night for Boston. Started out kind of innocently enough. There was some public gambling going on in the community, but after midnight, smashing of windows started. Widespread looting kicked in by around 2 a.m., and frankly, there was nothing, no officials to stop this from happening. And the morning papers jumped out, the Boston Globe, for the first time in the memory, Boston was given over to lawlessness. This was becoming a national story as well, the Philadelphia Public Ledger. Bolshevism in the United States is no longer a specter. So this is now the morning of September the, uh, Wednesday, the September the 10th, and Mayor Peters decided to take the initiative. He consulted with his lawyers, and he believed he had the authority to suspend the police commissioner, which is what he did. He suspended Curtis and took over that job himself, trying to organize citizens to help defend the country, uh, to defend the city. But again, this was not enough. And that worst night of violence actually occurred the night of the 10th. There was a riot, in fact, in Scully Square in which uh, four people were killed. This was getting a little bit now more out of control. Thursday, September the 11th, a key day in the entire affair as Calvin Coolidge, the governor of Massachusetts, took charge as he had his own lawyers looking into this. And they found a statute that said the governor has the authority to call for the aid of any policeman in the state. Well, that gave him the authority in his mind to really take over again. He reinstated Commissioner Curtis. He did call out the state guard. 5,000 members of the state guard were going to be coming in. Uh, and they started arriving that afternoon with bayonets fixed. It was clear they were there to uh, maintain the peace. And, and Coolidge at this point took a really bold stand. 
He wasn't going to agree with Commissioner Curtis that these men weren't on strike. They had abandoned their posts. According to uh, uh, Governor Coolidge, the action of the police in leaving their posts of duty is not a strike. It is a desertion. There is nothing to arbitrate, nothing to compromise. In my personal opinion, there are no conditions under which the men can return to the force. It's the boldest statement yet coming from Governor Coolidge and really no going back at this point. The strikers were terminated and uh, Commissioner Curtis was actually ready to start recruiting new uh, officers into the force. This was becoming a national issue. The president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, was actually out west at the time. He was on a train tour trying to lobby support from the public for his uh, pitch for the League of Nations. But he spoke on this on this Thursday, September the 11th. And he said, in my judgment, the obligation of a policeman is as sacred and direct as the obligation of a soldier. He is a public servant, not a private employee. And the whole honor of the community is in his hands. This was not a partisan issue. You're a Republican leader, Democrat leader leader all saying law, order, order, and duty were the things that had to triumph. Again, big concern of everybody was this possibility of sympathy strikes that could shut down the entire city, just like had happened in Seattle. Well, that was considered by a number of the local unions in Boston, but to the relief of the governor, the relief of the mayor, they came out this day and said, no, we're not going to have a sympathy strike. Now these strikes are actually coming up against the, the police force and they can almost see the writing on the wall. The governor's come out against them, the commissioner is holding fast, and no sympathy strikes are coming. Friday, September the 12th, the American Federation of Labor President Samuel Gompers decided to weigh in on this with a telegram to the governor, Calvin Coolidge, asking him not to punish the union leaders, not to terminate these workers, to go to arbitration, be reasonable, basically, it was what he was asking for. Calvin Coolidge responded the next day, Saturday the 13th, basically said, look, Mr. Gompers, it's too late. He said he is, he, the commissioner, has decided that the men have abandoned their sworn duty and has accordingly declared their places vacant. I shall support the commissioner in the execution of law and maintenance of order. Well, Gomper's going to try one more time. That day on the Saturday the 13th, he sent another telegram to the governor, and this time Governor Coolidge shut him down cold. He said back to uh, Gompers on his telegram on Sunday the 14th, your assertion that the commissioner was wrong cannot justify the wrong of leaving the city unguarded. That furnished the opportunity, the criminal element furnished the action. And then Coolidge wrote in this telegram the single sentence that eventually helped him become both vice president and president of the United States. He told the union leader that there is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, anytime. And that phrase, that single sentence sort of caught fire, electrified people across the country. You started now seeing almost immediately press accounts from the Boston transcript. The governor was the commander in chief. The people of the Commonwealth were the invincible army. The issue was America. And in the triumph of that issue, all America triumphed. Nationally, the New York Sun, a plain New England gentleman whose calm determination to uphold the law and maintain order in the situation caused by the Boston police walkout has made him a national figure. The Wall Street Journal, Governor Coolidge has shown the fiber of which presidents ought to be made, basically tied to that single sentence, obviously backing up his bold stand throughout that entire week. So again, over a thousand officers were terminated. The state guard had come in, now in force, they restored order, it took several months to backfill those officers. Actually, the commissioner decided to hire a whole bunch of out-of-work World War I veterans who populated many of those spots within the uh, police department in Boston. Eventually, by January, it was sort of back at full strength. This was a case of law, order, duty, reigning supreme, the firm actions of the governor, all embodied in that single sentence in that telegram from Coolidge. Now, he also shared his own views on his role in a letter to his father, in which Coolidge said, this was a service that had to be done. I've been glad to do it. The result won't matter to me, but it will matter a great deal to the rest of America. Well, he was wrong in that regard. It mattered a lot to him. Again, that single bold defiant sentence in the context of his bold action. And the American electorate was paying attention, including political operatives who were heading the next year to the national convention to nominate a Republican for president of the United States. And, he, and that was going to be influenced by these actions by Governor Coolidge this week of September during the Boston police strike. And that is the Boston police strike from Cal um, Calvin Coolidge from the life of Calvin Coolidge. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel.
Until next time, I'm David Fisher and this is Presidential Chronicles.